Here's a bit of confession to start us all off for the week. I'm an historian and an Americanist at that, but I try to stay away from the 20th century as much as possible. And basically that's because it's just so awful. It's the historical peak of death and destruction, statism and violence. It's the age of totalitarian states and bureaucratic dystopia. It's the height of slavery and forced labor in all of world history. It's the era when governments began holding the globe hostage with nuclear weapons and erected welfare states to keep us all from grumbling too much about it. And here in the US, so much of this awfulness began or quickened pace with FDR and his New Deal. Professor David Beto recently joined us here in Arlington to lead another advanced topics discussion. This one, Liberty, the Welfare State, and the New Deal. So here was my main takeaway from this set of readings on uh, the New Deal and Franklin Roosevelt. The New Deal was just absolutely ridiculous. It was just completely like, like cartoonish, almost like a graphic novel in its over-the-top nonsenseness. It was just completely ridiculous. And this, this reader is sort of cram jam full of New Deal legislation and political speeches and court cases adjudicating all of this stuff. And it's just page after page, it, it struck me how crazy all of this was. What, <laughs> I wonder if you have any commentary on that. Well, yeah, I think that that gives you some indication, but there, I mean, there's a lot going on here behind the surface as well, which I, I think there's a lot of evidence that uh, uh, the New Deal administration was engaging in a lot of shady practices, repressive practices, uh, so you have that added to to the equation as well. And, uh, you know, part of the craziness of the period, of course, is all of this money was spent. All these agencies were created. All these rules were, were brought in. And you have the longest depression in American history, uh, which is lengthened. Um, I think the evidence is pretty, pretty strong. It's lengthened by uh, Roosevelt's policies during this period. So it's a failure by, by all sorts of different standards. And I don't think that Roosevelt is a, per, is a very, um, very attractive historical character for, for numberless reasons. And the New Deal is certainly high up on the, uh, high up on the reasons. I mean, it, it just uh, it, it kept leaping out to me that, you know, so much of this was it, it's it's the equivalent of like casting oracle bones or something you know or making a blood sacrifice for for a good harvest uh it just makes absolutely no sense uh as a method of of real recovery from a depression you know a delegate it's just huge huge amounts of power delegated to the central government in one field after another and uh you know it's it's just hard to believe to me and maybe you can give us some insight on this it's it's hard to believe people were taken in by that well there are ideas that are floating around that that you know that roosevelt is is able to tap into one idea that that's very big and goes way back is a kind of an underconsumptionist idea you know you hear this kind of thing in some form today by people on the left that there is this imbalance there is this uh, maldistribution, unequal distribution of wealth. And sort of the crudest version of this or, uh, that you still get in the history textbooks is that the Great Depression is, is caused by uh, 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 the, the fact that the workers don't have enough and they can't spend, they don't have enough to spend to keep the economy going. So that this, uh, this economy is, is uh, you know, is very much out of, you know, out of whack, according to this theory. And Roosevelt is building on that. Um, I think that he's influenced by those kinds of ideas. I think he's very influenced by his background, by his uh, cousin, uh, uh, Teddy, who he very much looked up to, who, who uh, gave him away at his, uh, gave the bride away at his wedding because uh, Franklin, you know, was an inbred fr family because Franklin married his cousin, Eleanor, uh, and then she was in turn the niece of uh, Teddy Roosevelt. 
Um, so he very much admired him. Another man he admired was Woodrow Wilson, and Roosevelt was involved in all of this wartime mobilization, you know, centralization. And I think he had a real nostalgia for that. And I think he's trying to kind of recreate all of this. Um, he, I don't think he had much understanding of business. Uh, Roosevelt was born to wealth, and he was he was a he inherited wealth, and he dabbled in business. Um, in the 1920s, he was never very, uh, very successful in business. So I don't think he had really a good understanding uh, of those things. Um, and, you know, interestingly enough, the 1920s, he was teaming up with none, none other than Herbert Hoover. And they were involved in these various associations trying to fight what they called waste, right? So the competitive process, to a great extent, is viewed by Roosevelt as wasteful, as duplicative, uh, as chaotic, always seen it that way, is, is not planned. And he wants to plan. He wants to do the planning. And it, it seems uh, pretty ironic, I suppose, is the right word, the, the kind and gentle way of putting it. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a little ironic today that such, such a systematizer and a planner um, who was against the supposed chaos of the free market um, would come up with such a, a, a slew of <laughs> alphabet soup programs that all kind of trip and tumble over each other and bewilder the viewer with their uh, staggering numbers. I mean, we have one list of, I, it, it might be complete, but I'm not so sure. There's certainly a, a lot of these, but we have a list of New Deal, New Deal acronyms in our reader that includes 44 different programs or administrations. And I mean, I would read through them all, but I, I think you get the idea. It's just letter after letter after letter. And, uh, you know, the, the chaos of it is really what, again, leaps out to me here. Yeah, and I think Roosevelt did want more centralization, more uh, sort of uh, personal direction. And you, you get that especially in a second term where he's trying to do these various government re reorganization plans to kind of centralize the process more. But in some ways, he thrives out of that chaos and that bureaucratic competition because he can kind of play people off against each other. He can sort of get his way um, um, through a process like that. And Roosevelt is very good. He's very different than Trump. And, you know, whatever you think of Trump, Trump just sort of blunders in and says what he wants to do. Right. He's the guy running everything. Roosevelt was kind of content to be content to be a. Beside, but, but behind the scenes operator, and to to really let others take the heat, and um, uh, as a matter of fact, he's quite successful in that. Um, a lot of times, people will blame other people in the administration for various mistakes, um, because Roosevelt is very good to kind of stay in the background. Um, but I think his ultimate ideal is to centralize the process. But, you know, he's in, in 1933. He's pushing as fast as he could to push for more governmental control. And he's, he, do, he has to work with Congress. He's got all these people that have these ideas. So he's tapping into that. So that explains, I think, some of the chaos. But I think some of it is, is helpful to him. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, <laughs> it sounds like an awful lot of it was helpful to him. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not least of which are all these different uh, bills that just grant huge amounts of power directly to the president or to cabinet officials. You know, so I'm thinking of like the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Um, and, or the NRA, uh, which over and over yeah. again, this is the president shall do this. The president shall determine right. that the president and it leaves incredible uh, discretion to uh, to the president. I don't know if Obamacare quite did that in the same way, personalized it in that in that sense. Um, but of course, even though it says the president should have this power, Roosevelt, like I said, is very good if something goes wrong to kind of get a little bit, you know, seem a little bit above the fray. Now, you know, the, the melodrama of the different programs in the New Deal seems to, to fit with me 
uh, in the, the general scheme of the period, which is that, you know, this is the era of bigness, bigness all around, big business, big labor, and big government all teaming up together and coordinating their efforts together so that we don't have to have, you know, revolution in the streets or something like that. Um, so all these big organizations get together, and of course they kind of crush out anybody who's too little to have a voice at the table. But, you know, Roosevelt, like you said, kind of steps in and makes himself chairman of the board right there, of the, the little gang that he's got running. Um, so he's, he's in charge of the big government. He's in, in charge of setting standards for, you know, big business and for big labor. Well, it, it, he is. And you made a little comment there that I w- would like to pick up on about revolution. And Roosevelt certainly depicted himself that way. He would say things like, uh, I, you know, I, I, my goal is just to save capitalism. You know, I'm a cons- I'm really a conservative and other historians have picked up on that and kind of made the argument that, well, you know, you don't like the New Deal, but uh, it was necessary because look at the rise of uh, national socialism, look at the rise of uh, communism and all of this stuff. Roosevelt is able to save the system. So he's the ultimate conservative. He actually people say that. One complaint I would have about the choice of readings for the conference is it doesn't include a very interesting speech that Roosevelt gives only days before the election. And he gives speeches like this many times. It's called the Pittsburgh speech. It was in Pittsburgh. And it's not well known. In fact, I had my students read it and I had to download you know, the original newspaper uh, printing of the speech. And what it is, is it sounds like he's some, um, oh, I don't know some free market uh, budget cutter. He's attacking Hoover's spendthrift policies. He's saying, I agree with the Democratic platform. You know, the goal which said government spending should be cut 25%. You know, that's, that's pretty radical stuff. He's, you know, attacking bureaucracy. So he's, 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 when he runs in 1932, he's not running on what we think of as a New Deal agenda. It's very kind of trying to please everybody, but he is definitely saying a lot of stuff that more conservative, classical, liberal people could take hope in, um, attacking Hoover from the right in some ways. So the argument that the U.S. is anywhere anywhere near a revolution in 1932, I just don't buy into it. You know, Roosevelt runs a fairly conservative, fairly conventional campaign. Um, Are the people demanding a new deal in 1932? I don't see it. Is there a danger of a revolution? Don't really see it. Communist Party was a bust. Socialist Party didn't do do that great. Um, People want change. They're dissatisfied. They're repudiating Hoover. But does this mean they want a revolution? I don't see the evidence for it. But that's an argument that you often hear as to why Roosevelt was some essential figure. Yeah, you know, I was going to say that we have uh, at least two or three different historiographical strands running through the readings here, I think, at least for our secondary sources. Uh, And the first one is, just like you mentioned, I think this comes uh, across in our bits from Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., yeah. Um, who, who folks might know as sort of the, the court historian from the Kennedy administration. Um, and he really made his mark on the history profession by writing about Jacksonian America. And, uh, you know, his argument there was that he basically drew a straight line that was nice and pretty between Andrew Jackson and Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. So Jackson is sort of magically made into a New Dealer. Good yeah, he was a hero to the years. left. He was a hero to the <laughs> left during that period. You know, he was yeah. someone they looked up to. Interesting change since yeah. then. Yeah. And so that's how Schlesinger made his his career as a historian. And he sort of comes right out with this portrayal of a, a horrible, uh, depressing, downright dangerous uh, state of American life in the early Depression years. And, you know, he says there are unemployed veterans' armies marching on Washington. The people are ready to install some communist or fascist dictator at a moment's notice. It just really depends on 
who's ready to offer the swiftest relief program, you know? And for Schlesinger, it's like the entire world is about to be swallowed up in this kind of nihilism and infighting between radical groups. And then in Waltz's FDR, uh, swift and smooth, promising a new deal to save liberalism, and he does it. And, you know, you've, you've given us your thoughts about that point of view. Um, but then, you know, there are, there are other folks represented in the reader, like, like Henry Cabot Lodge and John T. Flynn, and then the, the uh, ever-present villain here to Roosevelt's hero, that's uh, Robert Taft. And uh, maybe you could go ahead and, and tell us a bit about their point of view on that question. Well, I mean, there, there, was, there was a strain of, I guess you'd call it anti-statism um, that was out there. Um, I wrote a book about this many years ago called Taxpayers in Revolt, which which discussed uh, the importance of tax resistance during the early 1930s. There was a massive tax strike in Chicago, pretty much shut down the tax system. The taxes were kind of uncollectible for a while. And a lot of these people are just saying, we think the problem here is the politicians are spending too much. They're getting fat. Uh, off their, you know, their salaries. I've had to cut back. Why shouldn't they have to cut back? So you do have that strain. You do have that strain of opinion that's out there. Um, now, I do think that something does happen. I think Roosevelt does have tremendous charisma. It is undeniable. Um, you know, I think he, you know, just of any president, you know, I think he, he ranks up there, maybe at the top. And people want action in 1933. They're perfectly happy, I think, to take action in the form of a budget cutter, I think, because you have budget cutters running for governors and, you know, doing quite well. Um, But Roosevelt chooses to use that charisma and that sense of desperation. And there is a sense of desperation, not revolution. But my God, look at all these problems, you know. I mean, people are worried about things like that. So they're willing to turn to somebody like that. He seems to offer that kind of leadership, and he pushes an agenda of big government. And I think he is able to popularize that agenda to a great extent uh, through just uh, his, the force of, of his personality um, but also we're creating a, 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 a dependent class. And there's some very interesting work that was done during the period. And Republicans like Taft were very worried about this and just didn't know what to do about it. Um, in various elections, including 1936 election, there's very good evidence that um, uh, Roosevelt is able to make effective use of government money to win elections, to carry states. In fact, much of the money he spends in 36 goes to swing states for relief, Um, not states that were the most desperately poor states, like a lot of the southern states. They get short shrift because they're secure, solid, democratic South. And without the South, by the way, Roosevelt wouldn't have gotten nearly as far as he did. That's his base initially. Uh, But in any, any case... Um, he he is able to use that. It's it's frustrating to a lot of these Republicans. And then if you see the Republican response, it tends to be a little bit weaker than maybe some of us would like. Uh, that you know, or classical liberals, partly because Roosevelt does prove effective in getting more people dependent on these programs. And as the depression goes on year after year after year. Uh, That level of people just saying, gee, we need this stuff is increasing. And so if you like, look at the 36 Republican platform, the rhetoric sounds very classical liberal. But then when you look at the the specifics, not that much different on a lot of basic issues uh, on the welfare and regulatory states. And now, of course, we know that the depression that – the New Deal did not end the Depression, and you know historians recognize at least two New Deals, and uh, there's there's uh, at least some that say you know there's a third New Deal involved, and that Roosevelt really discovered how useful war can be when you want to at least uh, in in um, appearance relieve an imposing depression, 
and you know it seems to me that this element of of World War II is just absolutely critical in securing FDR's legacy and really the legacy of the New Deal too because you know the opponents at least from what we read here these folks never seem to have really had serious doubts that the American people and the American way of life uh, would survive. They had no doubts that there would be temporary setbacks, but we would certainly survive. And we would, you know, uh, triumph no matter what was thrown in our way. And Henry Cavett Lodge kind of laughs off the idea that another power could ever seriously threaten us. Uh, <laughs> Herbert Hoover embarrassingly declares in 38 or 39 or something that Europe is at peace and seems like it's going to stay that way and everything's fine. And, you know, Flynn and Taft are certainly uh, aghast at how massive the, the New Deal has made the central government. But nonetheless, here comes the, the giant central government to help, you know, defeat fascism in World War II. And, you know, suddenly once everybody's employed by the army, uh, unemployment's not much of a big deal. And, you know, it gets conflated with New Deal success. Yeah, and it is not, I mean, it's, you said conflated is the right word because this is a standard line that you're going to see in American history textbooks and a standard belief. Well, gee whiz, you know, maybe the New Deal, I mean, more nuanced for you, it didn't really work in the sense of ending the Depression. However, uh, that was only because we didn't spend enough money, the government didn't. And when we finally did spend enough money in World War II, we see prosperity return. Well, as historians, as Robert Higgs have pointed out, um, that's not quite right. Uh, World War II economy is not a time of prosperity. It's a time of deprivation in many ways. Um, rationing, uh, more accidents on the job, uh, shoddy products. Uh, it's called the duration. And if you look at old movies from the 40s and they talk about the duration they're talking about a period of extreme sacrifice. And so really the recovery doesn't begin until long after Roosevelt dies, a genuine recovery, uh, which really occurs after demobilization in 46, uh, 47, that period, after you cut back <laughs> this warfare state, you know, which is, which is, you know, been a, been created during this period but anyway it, uh, yeah i mean this is they say roosevelt becomes dr new uh, he changes from dr new deal to dr win the war and he's able again to create a kind of new mythology around himself <laughs> that is solidified solidifies his power but also solidifies his the high regard that historians have for him now, I, I'm curious to know, you know, <laughs> Mussolini had these these amazing, you know, as part of the melodrama of fascism that he created, he had these these amazing building-sized portraits of himself in, in this uh, bizarre artistic style, sort of futuristic style. And uh, Roosevelt has the Tennessee Valley Authority <laughs> and other gigantic, you know, uh, uh, government monuments like that. Um, now, I'm wondering, what do you think are the most sort of over-the-top, melodramatic chunks of New Deal legislation? Oh, boy, that's a, that's a, you know, that's a very good, that's a very good question. I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, Tennessee, you know, the Tennessee Valley Authority would, you know, would be, you know, I'd have to put that, you know, very, you know, very, very high on, you know, high up on the list. Which, by um, the way, as, yeah. as one professor in grad school pointed out to our students, uh, that's really the one like true pure example of socialist enterprise in American history, at least one of very few. I had a professor at University of Wisconsin who was kind of a classical liberal type. He was like an adjunct. And he, he said, you know, everybody talks about the TVA. The guy who ran it wrote a book called I think it was called Grassroots Democracy. And his argument was that this is an example of democracy. He said, <laughs> yeah. And the guy says, yeah, sure, democracy, if you have to have an aqua, you know, an, an aqua lung, you know, to <laughs> keep your land, because a lot of land was taken, was seized. Mm -hmm. And an aspect of the TVA and also rural electrification in general 
that some people don't look at. You would think some, you know, advocates of renewables and environmentalists might, you know, appreciate more is it really is is a means to in some ways eliminate uh, alternatives to the grid right they're just sort of coming in there um um providing all of this electric power you know underselling uh, more decentralized local alternatives and so forth so the tva has a lot of and of course you know a lot of the dam building and so forth so there's a lot of environmental uh, uh, destruction and, and centralization of, of 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 power production and that kind of thing that's going on there that that um, people you know haven't paid enough attention to but was certainly raised at the time by people that were the were the victims of of of, of a lot of this stuff the dam building and uh, massive subsidies to agriculture and you know so forth. Of course, one of the other more ridiculous proposals from the New Deal, and thank God it was only a proposal, is FDR's court packing scheme. And uh, <laughs> one of my favorite quotes from the entire reader that we have here is from the Senate Judiciary Committee's report on the court packing scheme. And I mean, they of course soundly rejected the proposal, but uh, they concluded with a statement that some might say is pretty firm. They said, it is a measure which should be so emphatically rejected that its parallel will never again be presented to the free representatives of the free people of America, which is a pretty damning condemnation. Yeah, and it's, you know, in some ways, I, I think that we can, we can sort of poo-poo people during the period and say FDR has all this power, and he does in many ways. But one thing... Uh, one aspect of the 1930s where I think we've gone downhill on is that, you know, we've got the red team, red and blue team mentality, right? And uh, people are sort of digging their heels and uh, aren't willing to cross party lines if, if injustice is occurring or abuses are occurring in, you know, in their own party. And Roosevelt in 1936 wins the biggest landslide just about ever in American history. He's got veto-proof majorities, easily veto-proof majorities in both the House and the Senate, and he really is seeking out a third New Deal. I think that that's an accurate, he's got ambitions. He says to to uh, one of his advisors, I'm really radical now. And the court packing is really the necessary first stage for him because he sees this as a way that, you know, even though he's eventually going to get control, you know, because these justices are going to die or retire. Um, but he sees this as a way to, to eliminate the last check on what he wants to do in his term. And the, uh, he is blindsided by the opposition. And really, Democrats are leading the opposition, including a lot of New Deal types. Um, and the Republicans are just a rump and, you know, just a very small group. And they adopt a very wise strategy of just sitting back and letting the Democrats fight it out. And and I can't imagine that happening now with the Democratic president, where you have a significant segment of his own party saying this court packing stuff is enough. We cannot support this. Um, this is going too far. Um, and it really is quite remarkable, the rebellion that occurs. And this prevents his new, third New Deal. He gets some things. But really, he has many, many defeats after, in the two years after that uh, election, 36. Uh, in 38, he loses big time. He loses a lot of seats. And uh, at that point, you know, he's not going to get a third new deal. Uh, you know, it just isn't going to happen. But he has a massive majority. He's not able to get it, which is really quite encouraging. These are very left-wing congressmen that come in, in many cases, very left to come in in 36, but they, they're just, they rebel. A lot of them rebel. You know, I kept thinking with every, every Supreme Court case that struck down legislation or, you know, talking about uh, Congress warring with the president, every time I thought, my God, people, don't you see what you're doing? Don't you realize who's going to be president in 2019? Don't do it. Don't do it. But they did it. They did it well, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but there are some people, and I see that on FDR's uh, uh, efforts through a whole, you know, other research I've done on on civil liberties and privacy issues. 
there are people, a significant segment of people on the left, um, you know, uh, Democrats in many cases, who are willing to speak out on these issues, even against, you know, a president of their own party. And I just don't think that's the case anymore. And it's unfortunate. So I think in some ways, people in the 30s are a little, little bit more independent and a little less focused on, you know, our side versus their side, maybe. Or at least there's a big segment of opinion. Our greatest thanks to Dr. David Beto, both for his excellent discussion leading and his time on the podcast. For those of you out there enjoying the show, help us spread the word with a rating and review, and of course, your social media shares. I'll talk to you all again next week, and until then, keep the progress coming.